Good morning, everybody. So uh, I encourage you to uh, listen to uh, part one of my current study on the 144,000 and the 24 elders, which I discussed last week. The big question is, who are the 144,000 and 24 elders? What are, what are they portraying? What, is, what are they uh, describing? My basic premise that I mentioned last week is this that there is a new covenant that is a better covenant and it has superseded the old covenant. And the old covenant had a priesthood. And that priesthood is actually, in my opinion, this is the basic premise that I'm submitting to you for your consideration, that the old priesthood imaged a new priesthood. Now you can see that plainly in the person of Jesus Christ, that the old high priest imaged the new high priest, which is Jesus Christ, and that is made very clear. I would classify it as a no-brainer. Just read Hebrews. Just read Hebrews. But also that, that description of the old priesthood, and as you recall, they were all Levites. So Aaron, the high priest, was a Levite. His family members who served with him, they were the priesthood. They wore the special white uniforms. But the greater tribe of Levi, which was around 22,000 males, they served as a basically underneath the priesthood and the high priest. So what I'm suggesting to you now is that that priesthood is being described in the book of Revelation. And guess what? They're wearing white. Hint, hint. There's a lot of hints in there that go back to the old priesthood. To me, this is very exciting because you might say, well, as Christians, why do we care to learn about the Old Testament priesthood? Because it is a shadow of something greater that has been happening for the last 2,000 years. And it's of incredible importance. As I've already stated, but for those who, have, uh, who are new to this lesson, it is my opinion that the 144,000 is a symbolic number. It's not a literal number. This is the book of Revelation. This is apocalyptic literature, and numbers are meant to be understood symbolically. All of them. So you have to understand what do the numbers mean. The 144,000, in my opinion, is describing millions of mature and faithful believers. That's what's being described. Additionally, the 24 elders are describing uh, like a priesthood, but a higher echelon of, of believers like the Apostle Paul, like Peter. In Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, they're described as leading the many to righteousness. There are some unusual personalities in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Heroes of faith, like Noah, like Moses, like David. They are people that were, had a tremendous focus. They weren't perfect people, but they had a tremendous focus on living the spiritual life. So, that's what we uh, primarily discussed in part one, and I encourage you to go look at it. I think it'll bring more meaning and definition <coughs> of why it's important to understand the Old Testament. In Hebrews, we learn this idea that what was happening in the Old Testament was a shadow of something greater. A shadow is a very dark image. It doesn't have much definition. It doesn't have much nuance to it. Imagine a human being compared to the shadow of a human being. The Old Testament shadows are something that, are, that is inferior to what we have now in Jesus Christ. It is phenomenal once you start to see how the images take shape. Now, the 144,000 are mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, and they are mentioned in Revelation chapter 14. And we're discussing chapter 7 today. We'll discuss chapter 14 next week. 
But what's being described here is this. Before God's angels, this is what the book of Revelation is about, a judgment. And I'm submitting to you that that judgment is upon Jerusalem and upon Rome for their antagonism against the early church. That's, that is the framework. And, um, and before that happens, God's angels, before he unleashes God through his emissaries, judgment against the persecutors of the early church, God marked his faithful servants. Do you remember those verses? I would submit to you that that marking is not literal. It's symbolic. It's an image of God marking us. Now, that's before he unleashes the destructions that are described in the book of Revelation. But we also have to point out a couple of really important things. Before, 40 years before the destruction of Jerusalem, which again occurred ultimately in AD 70, 40 years before, do you remember Jesus Christ speaking in the temple at Matthew 24, 2? And said, Jesus said, not one stone here will be left upon another. When do you think that happened? He's speaking at around 30 AD, and he's prophesying a judgment that occurs in AD 70. And what else could you substitute for that judgment? What other event in history reaches anywhere close to the magnitude of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Any time Jerusalem is destroyed like that is a huge theological event. That's when the, Bab when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC, it was a huge event and prophets spoke about it and announced it for years. In the same way, years before, and in the same way, Jesus Christ and others were announcing a coming judgment upon Jerusalem. And that's the subject matter. Including it in there, included in there is Rome. Now you might also remember at Matthew 24, 27, Jesus Christ spoke of a coming. Now that type of language is consistent with the Old Testament idea of God coming in judgment. And it is described in Matthew 24, 27 as a lightning strike that happens in the east and shines all the way to the west. It was a world-altering event. It ended the sacrifices that had been offered in the temple for well over a th thousand years. Well, we go back to, well, just as so we talk about the temple, First, you have Solomon's temple. Of course, it's destroyed by the Babylonians. Then they come back and rebuild Zerubbabel's temple and once again start the offering of sacrifices. And then hear this. In AD 70, the Romans, who are prophesied in Daniel. It's, it's all very, very remarkable. As previously discussed, the judgments were focused on Jerusalem and Rome. The leadership of the advocates of the Old Covenant, aka the religious hierarchy and aristocracy, was located in Jerusalem. When you say, how did that work? Do you remember Paul being sent out with letters of authority from the Sanhedrin to persecute Christians? It's right there in Acts to see how it functioned, how it operated. The aristocracy that was primarily, they were Sadducees. They held the primary um, power underneath the Romans. You had Agrippa who, and the Herod family that were kings chosen by Rome. And the king, actually, Herod or whoever, whichever Herod was in place, it ended with a Herod Agrippa II. They're actually the ones that were given the authority by the Romans to choose the governor, and they had a role in, in choosing also the high priest. Everything had to be approved by, by Rome. So ultimately, of course, we know that Nero was located in Rome. And Nero launched his first official, this is the first Roman official 
persecution. If you read in Acts, you will see example after example of where the advocates of the Old Covenant would try to get Rome, for example in Corinth, to um, have the authorities punish the Christians to get them to stop preaching that New Covenant theology. And they were reluctant to do it in the same way that Pontius Pilate was a reluctant individual to, uh, to, to basically a, a sanction the, the killing of Jesus Christ. So during this roughly 40 years, ultimately Nero is the first emperor to say, I'm all behind this persecution. Do you remember the facts that, that led to that? There was a great fire in Rome in AD 64, which uh, the population blamed on Nero, even though he was out of town. However, the, uh, it's, it's interesting to note that the historian Tacitus noted that many Romans considered Christianity to be, Christianity to be the enemy of mankind. You might remember this at Matthew 24, 9, Jesus said, you will be hated by all nations because of my name. We Christians uh, had a fair amount of enemies, some more open than others. At Revelation 7, 2 through 3, we read, And I saw another angel ascending from the rising sun, holding the seal of the living God, and he called out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth, and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. We should note the following, that God often executes his judgments through his angels. That's a common theme in the Old Testament. Angels often act as God's agents for executing God's wrath. The earth was symbolic of the promised land. The earth is often just used as that promised land, although it can refer to, in some contexts, the entire world. The sea was symbolic for the unbelieving or heathen, na or heathen nations, a place of instability and chaos. Additionally, the trees were symbolic for the abundance and prosperity and blessing that is destroyed during times of war. One of the first things that any invading army does is they devour the landscape of its fruit, they cut down the trees, they create siege works, they destroy everything that surrounds for miles, that surrounds the city. The Greek verb Svaridsko is defined as to stamp with a signet or private mark for security or preservation. In this case, it should not be understood as a literal tattoo. The marking of the 144,000 communicates that God is not going to lose track of his faithful servants during times of historical crisis and or judgment. It should be noted that there was historical precedence for God's providential marking or stamping of his faithful servants. Do you remember that? Before the destruction of Jerusalem, hint, hint, 586 B.C., Ezekiel speaks in Ezekiel chapter 9, the Lord instructed an angelic servant to mark certain Jerusalemites to be spared from God's wrath. Hint, hint. That's the, the interpretation of the book of Revelation is primarily made through allusions, which uh, are the same as hyperlinks uh, that are, some people use as a description. That's the way the Bible ties it all together. To me, that's what, what when we've studied biblical imagery, why it's had such an impact on me, is that you see more God at work in this than anything else how these things are tied together by literally perhaps hundreds of different authors written over a tremendous span of time, and yet the interpretation is maintained by allusions or hyperlinks from one passage 
to the next. To me, it is phenomenal. It is incredible. To me, it is the greatest testimony that this is, in fact, the Word of God, which you can only believe by faith. By faith. Before the um, Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem in 586, the Lord Jehovah instructed his angel, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and mark and make a mark on the foreheads of all places of the people who groan and sigh over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. So just being upset over the state of your country says something about you as a person. Now, the faithful servants of, uh, and by the way, that was Ezekiel 9.4, the faithful servants grieved over the status of their nation. In a similar way, we should grieve over the status of our nation, which is more and more a pagan nation, separated from its Judeo-Christian heritage. At Revelation chapter 7, 4 through 8, the 144,000 were sealed. You remember that? That's, those are some key verses. Chapter 7, 4 through 8. The 144,000 were sealed, 12,000 from every tribe, but the tribe, if you want to start to understand the, the meaning of it all, you notice that the tribes of Dan and Ephraim are not included. The tribes of Dan and Ephraim were noted for their history of idolatry and apostasy. Judges chapter 17 through 21. At Judges 17, 6, we read that, that statement that they had no king. Remember this? This is before there was a king. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Does that sound similar to what's going on in our nation? Everyone does what's right in his own eyes. We, in the, in Dan abandoned the land allotted by God to them and embraced idol worship. And Ephraim aided and abetted the Danites in the idolatry. Then we read at Revelation 7, 9. This is extremely important. So if you go back and you read Revelation chapter 7, you're going to see this, this part that's focused on Israel. And then you're going to see this uncountable, this uncountable number. And I'm suggesting to you that it's the same group that's being described just from a slightly different vantage point. About the it's the same group as being described, but we're being told that they're not 144,000. They're an uncountable number. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count. From every nation, all tribes, peoples, languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. It's tying that idea together, the whole idea of a new priesthood, the same group of people that are faithful servants, and they had two things. They had white robes, which is something we see in the book of Revelation for the faithful servants, and palm branches were in their hands. In my opinion, this is an important dual imagery. Through this dual imagery, John the Elder is communicating that God's faithful servants are both. 144,000 faithful Israel, and an uncountable number from all the world, all the Gentile nations. The 144,000 are authentic Israelites who follow in the steps of Abraham, and they are a great multitude which no one can count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. It's interesting to note that historically, when the Israelites went to war against the, Midian, the Midianites, Moses sent 1,000 warriors from each tribe. That's Numbers 31, 1 through 5. The fighting force consisted of a total of 12,000 warriors, and they represented the elite warriors of Israel. The 144,000 are representing the spiritual elite, a.k.a. mature believers. Our connection with Israel remains extremely 
important. All we have to do is read Romans, Romans 11, 15 through 19. The Apostle Paul taught that we Christians have been grafted into the rich root of Israel. As long as we Christians remain faithful, we remain grafted into faithful Israel. But it is also true to say that to be faithful, genetic descendants of Abraham must continue to walk in the steps of Abraham. Faithful Jews and Gentiles both are authentic Israel. The 144,000 is, symbol, is a symbolic number of the faithful believers, which no human can count, that come from every nation, tribe, people, and language. It is important to note that the 144,000 are dressed in white. At Revelation 19.8, we read that the bride of the Lamb, a.k.a. the 144,000, the bride is clothed in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So right there in the book of Revelation, you get an illusion, hint, hint, what does the white clothing, what is it representative of? It is representative of those who put on the spiritual life, who become authentic servants of God, and that is a a symbol of their righteous acts, which can only come from God when we live and function in God. The white robe is the uniform of faithful servants, just like it was the uniform of the, of the priests in the Old Testament. For much of Israel's history, only the priests had special white uniforms. But did you notice that in 1 Chronicles 15, 27, King David directed the Levites to wear white uniforms, and David himself put on the uniform of a priest. The wearing of white uniforms is an important imagery which communicates God's faithful servants are acting as the new priesthood. So that's a basic point that I'm trying to, trying to ask you to consider. At Revelation 7, 9, it is also noted that God's faithful servants, a.k.a. the 144,000, had palm branches in their hands. Do you give any significance all at all to those palm branches? Perhaps you might recall at Psalm 92, 12, the psalmist said, The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. There's illusions that help us understand and interpret. The imagery is clear in my mind. The 144,000 are righteous believers, a.k.a. faithful servants, who are functioning as a new part of a new priesthood. We can be experientially, experientially righteous only when we function in Christ. This is our new way of being. When we walk by the Spirit, wherein the Word is a light to our feet, when we trust in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in our inherent fleshly capacity to live this new supernatural way of being in Christ, which is the new covenant. If you want a shorthand definition of the new covenant, I would say it's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and then live in Christ. That's our new covenant. And like I discussed last week, what is a priesthood? It's mediators, mediators of a new covenant to the world. Stated most simply, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and now live in Christ. And it's a little different than the old covenant in a very important way. You know, in the old covenant, the word was more focused on the idea of an agreement. But we couldn't live up to the agreement. In the New Testament, the idea of the covenant is like a bequeath, like a last will and testament. It's something somebody gives to you, hands over to you, and all you do is live in this new relationship. It's vastly superior. We couldn't meet the requirements of the old covenant because in our fleshly capacity, we don't have the capacity to meet 
the high standards of God. He's given us something new. It's a new covenant where we can now live in Christ. I mentioned last week that over 80 times we see the preposition in, epsilon, and uh, new, and we're now, that's our Greek scholar, he's got three years of Greek, and that is how our new life is in Christ, in Christ. In Revelation chapter 7, at verses 11 through 17, we see that the 24 elders are leading the 144,000 in the worship of the Lamb. The new priesthood leads humanity in the worship of the Lamb, but the 144,000 are essentially following the heroes of faith. Did you notice? People like Paul and Peter, John the Elder, Luke, Luke alone may have written close to 30% of the Bible by, by himself. Of course, he was with a pretty powerful group of people that he was with, Paul being one of them when he would put his thoughts together. At Revelation 7, 11 through 12, we read, And all the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders and the living creatures, which are angelic beings, in my opinion, and they all, angels and the elders, fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. The faithful angels and elders are the example, provide the example of worshipping the Lamb. At Revelation 7:12, they say, Amen, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might belong to our God forever. Amen. Worship is more than something we do on Sunday. Worship is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle where we day to day put God's will above our own. At Revelation 7, 13 through 14, we read, Then one of the elders responded, saying to me, These who are clothed in the white robes, who are they? That's really a, that's a tremendous question that's being asked to the audience also. Who are they? And where are they from? And John said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who came out or come out of great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Because of the blood of Christ, we have access to God. By living in fellowship with God, we can experience progressive sanctification. From time to time, yes, we will experience tribulation. Those particular believers that lived at the time of Nero's persecution were experiencing a great tribulation. That period of time really runs from AD 64. Nero basically is uh, commits suicide in, in AD 68, and of course all these other cataclysmic events occur after that, including a Roman civil war and the destruction of Jerusalem. Peter and Paul endured persecution for their faith for over 30 years. Under Nero's persecution, the persecution and tribulation reached an apex and escalation of suffering. Peter was crucified. Think about the, the impact upon early Christianity. Peter was crucified. Paul was decapitated. James, the Lord's brother, was stoned to death. At this time, John, the elder, is on Isle of Patmos, in, basically in prison, imprisoned. All of these events had a, a, an incredible impact on the early church. Would you have been praying to God for relief? Would you be praying for God to intervene in human history? When you saw the tremendous suffering that people were experiencing? In Rome, Christians were crucified, torn apart by wild dogs, set on fire, and used as torches to decorate Nero's parties. While Christians burned, Nero paraded through his garden parties dressed as a charioteer, a charioter. He loved chariot races. That's what he, that was his chariot. He loved those. Tacitus said that 
eventually the people of Rome started to feel some sympathy for the Christians. Not in their minds, because the Christians were not deserving of some horrible punishment. See, it was generally believed that we were deserving of something horrible. But because the Christians were being murdered primarily to placate Nero's cruelty, who they also considered to be a megalomaniac. As I discussed last week, the 140,000 were also representative of the Old Testament idea of the remnant. Are you familiar with that Old Testament concept? The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia states that the remnant is an important concept in biblical theology applied to three types of groups. The first is simply a historical remnant made up of survivors of some catastrophe. catastrophe. Like, for example, if you're Noah and his family, you're the pretty small remnant. The second consists of the faithful remnant distinguished from the former group by their genuine spirituality and true faith and their true faith relationship with God. This remnant is the carrier of all divine election promises. The third is the most is most appropriately designated as the eschatological remnant, consisting of those faithful servants or remnant who go through the cleansing judgments and apocalyptic woes at the end of time and emerge victorious after the day of Yahweh. And I'm submitting to you that the destruction of Jerusalem was a day of the Lord and the, what the judgments upon Rome. Does that mean that we don't look forward to a judgment? <laughs> now, I think there will be one in the, in the future. And as I've mentioned, I think the coming of Jesus Christ, the return of Jesus Christ to planet Earth will probably have some similarities associated with what happened during the uh, 70 AD and those years leading up to that point in time. I think that there's a certain, what we see are patterns in how things operate. Um, when we see the words coming in clouds, do you ever notice that clouds can bring both blessing and judgment? They can, they're bringing relief in one, in one aspect, and they're bringing judgment. They're bringing both. We can't live without clouds coming, but they can bring good to some and bad to others. The 144,000 and the 24 elders are the victorious remnant who will rule over God's kingdom. In fact, here on planet Earth, they are already ruling through our execution of the spiritual life, through our prayers. We impact world history through our prayers. That's how important it is. Additionally, there are some that are already in heaven. I would submit to you that Revelation 26, chapter 20, verse 6, is describing individuals like the Apostle Paul who died and are now in heaven and are already participating, he is, as one of the 24 elders. Though they have passed from this life to the next, they continue to serve God. Thank you and have a great day.